Hebrews chapter 2 and beginning to read at verse 1. Just the first nine verses of Hebrews chapter 2 please. Hebrews 2 and verse 1. Therefore we ought to give the most uh, earnest heed to the things which we have heard. Lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? God also bearing the witness, both with signs and wonders, and with divers miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost, according to his own will. For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come whereof we speak. But one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visitest him? Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownest him with glory and honor, and didst set him over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, He left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. We'll end there at verse 9, and we know that God will bless the reading of his word to your hearts again uh, tonight. The writer of the Hebrews is speaking to believers here, not non-believers. This admonition is to encourage believers to pay attention to the great salvation that they have received from the Lord. Verse 1 says, lest at any time we should let them slip. And as believers, it's easy, isn't it, to fall away sometimes. It's easy to slip sometimes. Warren Wearsby says about this, it's easy to drift with the current, but it's more difficult to return against the stream. Our salvation is is a great salvation purchased at great price and brings with it great promises great blessings and leads to a great inheritance but i want us to come and they used to teach us in bible college don't use springboard sermons but we all do that sometimes don't we and we're going to use a springboard sermon tonight because verse verse three here says how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us, or, uh, sorry, confirmed unto us by them that heard him. How then shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? I'm sure for all of us that we're all guilty of putting off until tomorrow things that should have been done today. A decision that we should have taken care of today. So often tomorrow is next week, and next week is next month, and next month is next year. Isn't that right? We talked about that this morning, how quickly time goes. Karen says, my phrase is, it'll do for now, or I'll put it there for now. Maybe some of you do the same thing, and that drives her nuts. But then you see, sometimes she slips up, and she says the same to me, and I go, oh, you can't say that. You can't just put it there for now. Anyway, the tendency to delay is harmful, isn't it, in every area of our lives the person in debt who says i'll pay my debts tomorrow well so often could end up bankrupt the person who is sick and who doesn't go to the doctor well could very well end up in hospital or the cemetery isn't that true the person who puts off their schooling like bill woods could so often find themselves with how work with how a job i whenever i was mission many years ago we met a couple down around Balamina. And they've been out together for about 20 years. And this is no joke. And we hear jokes about this, but this is a true story. They've been out together for 20 years, and she was fed up, for she wanted him to ask uh, her to marry him. And she hinted many times, and of course, if we were past a jeweler shop, they stopped and had a wee look in, and she'd, well, that's a nice ring, or that. And it didn't make any odds to him, not a fidge. But it was leap year one year, and she decided that she was going to turn it on him. And she said, would you never think of getting married? And his reply to her was, sure, who would have us now? That was the reply. 
I wonder if you ever wondered why people put things off. But most importantly, why people put off their most important decision in life. And that decision isn't who we're going to marry, although that's an important one. That decision isn't where we're going to work, where we're going to have a job or employment. But that's a decision for Christ. And so many people around us procrastinate or they put off to tomorrow. They tell us that procrastination is the thief of time. Someone said that tomorrow is often the busiest day of our lives. And there's a wee song by some country and western singer who sings tomorrow never comes. And that's true, isn't it? Tomorrow never comes. In the New Testament, there are three unanswered questions. In Mark chapter 8 and verse 36, one of the questions is where Jesus said, what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? It's an unanswered question. And then in 1 Peter 4 verse 17, what shall be the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? And here we've read that third question tonight as we've read Hebrews chapter 2. How then shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? As I said already, although the writer here is speaking to believers, I want to make this a gospel question tonight. Because I believe that as a gospel question, that this is one of the most challenging, searching, and solemn words in all of Scripture. It falls into three simple points, and I want to leave them with you quickly tonight. The first one is a great provision that God has made for all of us, and that is salvation. The second one is a great uh, peril that faces each one of us, and that is neglect. And the third one is a great problem that's ahead of us if we neglect salvation. For it says, how then shall we escape? First of all, the great provision. What's the greatest provision that God has made for us? The answer can be given in one simple word, and that is the word salvation, isn't it? What does the word salvation mean? Does it mean by being a good person? By being moral and upright? By being religious? By saying prayers? By attending a place of worship? By being baptized as a child? Is that enough to get us to heaven? Is that what salvation means? That we're born into a Christian country. Dear help us if this is a Christian country that we're living in today. Sadly, if we went out into the street in Korean and talked to many folk, or if you went down into Belfast and talked to many folk in the streets, they would tell you that the Christian faith is something that is a lifestyle that you choose or don't choose. It's just a way of life. That's what they'll tell you. You're supposed to love your neighbor. You're supposed to forgive your enemies. You're supposed to do good to those around you. And as I said already, some people really do believe, including some people in my family, that because they had a few drops of water sprinkled them on, on them as a baby and were called names by the minister, that that's enough to get them to heaven. Folks, if that was the case, our missionaries would go around the countryside. We'd do the same here. And we'd lift every child from everywhere we could see them. And we'd throw water in their head and call them names. And that would get them into heaven, wouldn't we? But the Bible tells us it's not by works of righteousness that we have done. It's not by works lest any man should boast. Salvation simply implies forgiveness. Safety. Deliverance perseverance, soundness. It gathers all the redemptive acts and purposes together and processes together. All the big words that so often we don't know what they mean, is not right. Justification, redemption, grace, propitiation, forgiveness, sanctification, glorification. All of these things gathered together. Salvation, that's what it means. The past, the present, the future, that whenever we come to Christ in salvation and trust him as our saviour, that we're saved from the penalty of sin, we're saved from the power of sin, and one day we'll be saved from the very presence of sin for all eternity. Isn't that wonderful tonight? Salvation provides complete restoration for the sinner. The provision that God has made to bring us back into fellowship with himself and into the safety of the family and fold of God. Where do we learn about that? In Luke chapter 15, don't we? 
where the Lord Jesus gives those three parables to illustrate the meaning of salvation. He speaks about the shepherd that has the hundred sheep. And he counts the sheep every night, putting them in. And then he realizes that there's a sheep not there. Even though he is 99, safely in the fold, he loves the one lost sheep enough. He cares for it to go and look for it. And he searches until he finds it and he brings it back into the safety of the fold and family. We read of the woman with the coin and whenever we were in Portugal back in May time, one of the ladies who was with us on the team, she's a great lady, she's from Belfast, and Lorna was doing the devotions one of the mornings, I think it was the last morning, she was sharing devotions with us, and she spoke on the woman with the coins and how she lost that one coin. Even though she had ten coins, she said, that one coin was so precious to her. Uh, I don't know whether I told you the story or not before, but whenever Karen and I got engaged, Karen was nursing and I was in the faith mission at the time. And uh, Karen, of course, because she was nursing, couldn't wear her engagement ring to work. So she kept it in the wee box beside the bed. And then whenever she'd come home, if she was going out or whatever, she'd put the ring on her and she'd go off to whatever she was doing. And one night she came home from work and she was going over to my parents' house and uh, she went to the box and opened the box and the ring was gone. And she went searching through all her handbags. The men will understand that, won't you? Uh, all the handbags, all the coats, everything. She went searching through the whole house where she thought she might have left it or put it. And she couldn't find it anywhere. And then she heard that her cousin had arrived up with, a little, with her nephew and another little girl to the house that day. And he was just at the stage where he was about two and he was flushing everything down the toilet. And she thought, uh-oh. My ring must be gone. <laughs> and then she contacted her cousin to say, did you see the ring anywhere? And she went out to uh, where she lived, out, and there was a little, the little girl who she brought with her was out playing, and she went over to her to say if she saw it anywhere, and the little girl was wearing two of Karen's rings. She took a lend of them. Uh, and I tell you, there was great rejoicing whenever the ring was found, because Karen also couldn't find the insurance of the ring, and she knew I wouldn't be bad her another one very quickly, or couldn't afford to buy another one very quickly. Anyway, we rejoiced that the ring was found. And you can imagine as the woman swept her house and she looked for that coin, because that coin was so precious to her, how she rejoiced when she found the coin that was lost. It was precious on that coin. And Lorna gave us all little coins that day. And she said, you know, I want you to think of this coin. And as you go out to reach the people in Fatima, where we were, tens of thousands of people, she said, I want you to take that coin and I want you to look at it, put it in your pocket and feel it and bring it out and look at it because it reminds us that every single person that's born into this world is precious to God. God's image is stamped on them and they need to come to him and trust him. They're lost and they need to be found. Do you get the picture tonight of the lostness of a soul? The writer to the Hebrews calls it a great salvation. Not just a salvation, but a great salvation. Because, I'm sorry, not only that, but he speaks of a so great salvation. Why is it so great? Very quickly, it's so great because of the great love that provided salvation for us. The hymn writer says, Oh, the love that drew salvation's plan. Oh, the grace that brought it down to man. Oh, the mighty gulf that God did span at Calvary. Mercy there is great and grace is free. And there our burdened souls find liberty at Calvary. Salvation is so great because of the great love that prompted it. And the great love that provided it. You know, we all know the verse John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Christmas is coming. And maybe you're all out shopping. I usually shop on Christmas Eve, but it's a Sunday this year, and I'm glad it is. Um, but I hate shopping at Christmas time. And last year, Karen was doing uh, interviews for work. And she was studying an awful lot for the two interviews. She had one on the Tuesday and one on the Friday. Christmas Eve was Saturday. And so she sent me out to shop to get a few presents. I hadn't a clue what to buy. And I went to the boulevard down in Banbridge, the, the outlet there. 
and that's where I was told to go, and I was told what shop to go to, and I rang her, and she said, don't even talk to me, I'm studying, just get whatever you want. So I bought the presents, and I brought them home, and then I got et, because I spent too much money on them, that was why. What did you buy them that for? And you know, at Christmas time, it's not true, maybe someone gives you a gift, and you look at it, and you think, eh, is that all they think of me? Or maybe they give you something and you look at it and you think, oh, I didn't buy them anything as good back. <laughs> I didn't think they liked me so much. Isn't that right? And so often we measure what people do for us or what they give us. We measure their love to us. But we can't measure God's love tonight. We can never even begin to measure God's love. See, it Spurgeon was on, the room, uh, uh, the, on a uh, farm one day and he was walking around with a farmer and on the roof of the barn there was a weather vane and underneath it was written, God is love. And it's funny because my grandparents on the farm, they always had a weather vane up on the roof, but they didn't have God as love underneath it, but they had a weather vane. And he was walking around and he said to the farmer, what do you mean by that? Do you mean that God's love is as changeable as the weather? We know what that's like in Northern Ireland, don't we? And the farmer turned to him and he said, oh no, Mr. Spurgeon. God is love no matter what way we turn. No matter what way the wind blows, God is love. Herein is love. Not that we love God, but that God sent his son to be the, <coughs> the propitiation for our sins or the substitute for our sins. Uh, I love the words of the hymn, and I'm sure you sing it sometimes. Could we bethink the ocean fill? Or where the skies, you just go and look at the beach. Go down and sit there and look at the ocean in front of you. Could we bethink the ocean fill? Or where the skies of parchment made? Was every stalk and earth a quill and every man a scribe by trade to write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry. Nor could the scroll contain the whole though stretched from sky to sky. It's so great because of the great love but it's also so great because of the great price that was paid for it. It cost God, didn't it? It cost God everything that he had. To send a son into the world. As that little baby in Bethlehem. Creation cost God a word and it was done. Salvation cost God the word. It cost him the gift of his precious, precious only son. The saviour of the world. To go all the way to the cross. And wrote, 1 Peter 1.16 reminds us. For as much as ye you know that you are not redeemed with corruptible things such as silver or gold but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without spot and without blemish. As Jesus cried, Ted, a less die on the cross, he cried, it is finished, it stands finished, it always will be finished. A thing is recognized by, uh, as precious by what we pay for it, isn't it? If you pay five pounds for something, you maybe wouldn't call it that precious, would you? And, you know, um, whenever someone comes into the house and they see that ornament that you paid a fortune for and the next thing it goes flat across the floor. Whenever we first got married, we had a lot of wedding presents and people were buying us doting ladies and all in those days. And uh, we moved into our house and, you know, uh, it was just the two of us, of course. Um, we'd only moved in a couple of days and all our new presents were everywhere. All our new furniture was everywhere. And we were living in England in the deals. And there was this family that came to visit us. They were missionaries in Papua New Guinea. And their wee boys had got the don't lady and were banging it up and down on the glass table. And I was sitting sweating, thinking to the mother, would you not hit him a crack? Or would you lift it off him and don't let him smash it? But of course, they lived in the middle of the forest and the jungle. They, they had no don't ladies out there. And then they got a hairbrush and made a bowl, a, a Tyrone crystal bowl with potpourri in it. And the next thing, the potpourri was flying all around the house, everywhere. And that was only a few pounds, but it was precious to us because someone had bought it for us. If you spend 5,000 pounds on something, it'll be a wee bit more precious, won't it? And if you're like David, a millionaire, and you can go and you can buy something at 5 million pounds, then, you know, that would be very precious to you, wouldn't it? And we, of course, <coughs> we limit things and we, we recognize things uh, by being precious by what they cost us. But the price for salvation was nothing less than the blood and the death of the everlasting Son of God. 
the pain and the agony of his suffering physically. But so often we forget the pain and agony of his suffering spirit, suffering spiritually. As God his Father turned his back on his son, as the darkness came over, and as the Lord Jesus Christ hung and on the cross and died for our sin on the cross, he cried out, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. As he cried it, it is finished. As he cried it into thy hands, I commend my spirit. And salvation tonight is so great because of the great price that was paid for it. It's also, time's going, it's also so great because of the great blessing included in it. Salvation provides every blessing that we need. Salvation provides our need completely in the Lord Jesus Christ tonight. When we're saved, it means that we're forgiven. It means that we're cleansed. It means that we receive eternal life. We talked about the peace this morning, the peace that passes all understanding, that the world can't take away from us, but a peace that the world can't give us. The joy in knowing Christ and serving him. The assurance that heaven is our home for all of eternity, that we don't have to hope so, or maybe we'll be there, but we can know so tonight because of what Christ has done for us and offering us salvation. What a great provision for us. Not only a great provision, a so great salvation, but also we see from verse three, the great peril as we think of the great salvation and the so great salvation tonight. What is the greatest peril that faces every man and woman and young person, boy and girl around us tonight? It's the peril of neglecting the salvation that God has so graciously and freely provided for us to be saved. There are three words that describe the attitude of every person of the gospel. Anybody you meet down the street in Korean, there are three words, three attitudes that describe them tonight. Each one are doing, each one of us tonight are doing one of these three things whenever we're confronted with God's salvation. The first one is there are people who are rejecting God's salvation tonight. And it's a very dangerous thing to reject the salvation that God has offered for you and me. John 5 verse 40, Jesus said, And ye will not come to me that you might have eternal life. And sadly, there are many people around us tonight who are rejecting. They want nothing to do with God or nothing to do with the things of God. There was a man called Harry Ingersoll. Maybe some of you have heard the illustration before. And Harry Ingersoll stood in Preacher's Corner Um, in Hyde Park in London and he would stand up in a box and he would take his watch off and he would hold it up in the air and he would say if you're there's really a God up there I want you to strike me down dead in one minute and the crowds would gather around him and they would listen to him as he said this he would do it time and time again and he would hold it up just flaring in the face of God really and saying if you're really there strike me down dead in one minute And he would count down the 60 seconds. And the crowds around would stand and they would actually hold their breath as the 60 seconds were coming up. Because they thought a thunderbolt would come from heaven and Harry Ingersoll would be gone. There was a wee lady who was standing there one day and she listened to him and watched him as he did this. And when he had finished (coughs) the one minute, she turned and she said, Mister, are you married? She was a Scottish lady. He said, yes, I am. She said, have you any barons? He said, yes, I have three boys. And she said, well, if one of your barons came to you with a knife and told you to kill him, what would you do? Oh, he said, oh, I wouldn't do it because I love him too much. And the wee woman said, well, God loves you too much too. You know, whenever Harry Ingersoll came to die, he had all his atheistic friends sitting around his bed, his deathbed. And he was slipping away and they were shouting at him, Oh, Harry, hold on, hold on, don't go yet, don't go yet. And in a very weak voice, he cried out, What have I got to hold on to? I have nothing. I have nothing. And I'm about to die. 
And sadly, we could reiterate that story over and over again tonight, couldn't we? Of people that I know, people in my family who have died, deathbeds that I've sat at. Trying to talk to them about spiritual things. And they didn't want to know. Nothing to hold on to. And sadly, there are many people tonight who are rejecting God's great salvation. There are people who are accepting God's salvation, and that's an encouragement to us too, isn't it? Because right across our province tonight, as the gospel is being preached, there are men and women and young people and boys and girls today who have come to know Christ as their Savior. Who have realized that what the word of God says is true. That the God of the word is true. That the Lord Jesus Christ took their place. And they've cried out to him for salvation. And the Bible tells us that even the angels in heaven are rejoicing. Over one sinner that comes to repentance. John 1.12 reminds us. But as many as received him to them give me the power to become the sons of God. Even to those who believe on his name. But sadly, there are those who are neglecting salvation. The word refers to those who don't deliberately reject salvation, but at the same point, don't accept salvation. They simply put off what God has provided for them. They attend church missions. They hear the gospel. They agree with the gospel. They could preach the gospel. But they've done nothing about it. A very dangerous place to be. This is the dreadful peril that faces multitudes of people, the great peril of neglect tonight. It's so easy to get taken up with our homes, so easy to get taken up with our businesses, with our making money, with our hobbies, with our pleasures, and neglect salvation. And I know many people, as they were young, God challenged them in church, and they said, I'll wait until I'm 30, I'll wait until I'm 40, I'll wait until I'm 50. I'll wait until I'm on my deathbed and then I'll cry out to God for salvation. And sadly, many people don't have a deathbed experience. Suddenly, they're taken into eternity. If we neglect our bodies, we suffer. If we neglect our business, we can't expect it to prosper. If we neglect our home, it falls into disrepair. But people think differently about their soul, don't they? Spiritual matters, they think differently about it. Salvation, they think differently about it. And certainly the neglect of some things only bring temporal consequences. But the neglect of the soul brings eternal consequences tonight. Forever. You neglecting your soul tonight? The rich young ruler said, God said to him tonight, thy soul shall be required of thee. And I think of many people who have sat in meetings and missions down through the years. And God has spoken and God has challenged hearts. And they've gone out of the meetings the same as they came in. They've neglected salvation. And I believe there are some that are in eternity tonight. And they're remembering the meetings they sat in. And they're remembering the opportunities and the regret of neglecting salvation. We live in a very privileged part of the world in Northern Ireland where there's so much gospel preaching, where there's so many missions, where there's texts along the road, where there's tracts put into our hands in the towns. We live in a privileged, privileged place that many other parts of the world don't have. And yet so many neglect God's great salvation. Very quickly, not only the uh, neglecting salvation, but we see the great problem here as well. If we neglect God's provision for our souls, it tells us here, how shall we escape? From the beginning of human history, Satan has tried to convince men and women that they could sin and get away with it. He convinced Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, didn't he, at the very beginning of time. And they disobeyed God and sin came into the world. And Romans reminds us, for by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for all have sin. He wants us to believe that we can do what we want, when we want, where we want, how we want, and get away with it. But the Bible reminds us that sin, when it's finished, brings forth death. Not physical death, just 
but spiritual death or separation from God for all of eternity. And the Bible tells us very clearly that there's only one way for a sinner to be saved. It tells us very clearly that there's only one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, that there's only one way available to us. And if we neglect salvation or reject salvation tonight, we will never, ever be saved. We will never be in heaven. That's what the Bible tells us. Revelation 20 verse 15 that whosoever was not found written in the book of life would be cast into the lake of fire. John 3 36 reminds us he that believeth in the son hath everlasting life but he that believeth not the son shall not see life but the wrath of God abideth on him. John 3 18 whosoever believeth not is condemned already. Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. How will we escape? There's no escape. If we reject or neglect salvation tonight. In closing, because time's away. <clears throat> there's an old myth, and you've maybe heard this before. An old myth that the devil called his demons to conference. And they were sitting, chatting among themselves. The best strategy they could make up to stop people from coming to Christ. And the first demon said, I'll go to earth and I'll tell them there's no God. And the devil said, it's not going to work. Because when they look around them and see the beauty of creation, they know that there's a creator. That'll not work. And then the, de the second demon said, I'll tell them that the Bible isn't true. And the devil shook his head. He said, no, that's no good either. Because when they read through the Bible and they read of the prophecies and see as they read through the Bible the prophecies being fulfilled, then they will know that the Bible is true. And then the third one said, I'll tell them they don't need to be saved. And he said, yes, there are a few who will believe that, but most people realize that they're sinners and they need a savior. And the fourth demon said, I'll tell you what we'll do. I'll tell them, yes, there is a God. I'll tell them, yes, the Bible is true. I'll tell them, yes, they need to be saved. But wait until tomorrow. And sadly tonight, hell is full of people who have waited until tomorrow. And sadly, tomorrow never comes. And we could give many illustrations of that as we read through the Bible. The rich man in Luke 16. That he cried out in mercy for mercy. But it was too late. There was no second chance. There was no going back. How shall we escape tonight? If we neglect so great a salvation. For you to walk out the door tonight if you're not saved. That's your decision made. If you walk out the door of this church without Christ. And tomorrow could be too late. Tonight could be too late. Let me finish with the words of this song. I'm not going to sing it, don't worry. <laughs> but the words of this card, I sing it sometimes. And as I so often quote this, or whenever we used to sing it, it reminded me of a young man who lived not far from here. A young man who had everything going in life. And he stood in the pub one night with his glass of beer in his hand. And he said, live fast and die young. That's my motto in life. That's my motto in life. Live fast and die young. He was speaking to a friend of ours and he was going down a road into Balamoni where in those days there was no barriers on the level crossing. And the friend of ours as they talked to him that day was again bringing the gospel to him like he did many times before. And he said, I have everything going on in life. I have businesses, I've got money. He just bought himself a fast motorbike. Cars, he had everything going in life, as he thought. And he laughed at this friend of ours who talked to him that day. But on his way back down the Kilrats Road, he didn't see the train. And he went into the side of it, he was flying on his motorbike. And that afternoon, he went into eternity. And this song reminds me of that. It says, I get up on Sunday morning, went to the church at 10. I listened to the words I heard time and time again. The preacher spoke of sinful lives. It seemed that he spoke of mine. 
but I thought I'd get plenty of time. Plenty of time to decide where I'm bound to eternal darkness or to a heavenly crown. I'm just a young man, not yet in my prime. So I'll just wait. I've got plenty of time. The verse is going to say, I walk down on down life's pathway, living as I wish to live. I to beat the other fellow out to see what life could give. Making money isn't sinful. Having fun, it's not a crime. So I'll just wait for I've got plenty of time. Then the last verse says this. Before I knew what had happened, earth's scenes had passed away. And millions stood before God's throne, for it was judgment day. Now eternal darkness beckons, and the name God calls is mine. But I thought I'd get plenty of time. Plenty of time to decide where I'm bound, to eternal darkness or to a heavenly crown. I'm just a young man, not yet in my prime. So I'll just wait. I've got plenty of time. Eternity waits. I've got plenty of time to think of all the days that Christ could have been mine. But my chance is over. Earth's scenes are left behind. And here I am. I've got plenty of time in a lost eternity having wasted my time. The great provision, the great peril, the great problem How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? We're going to turn in our hymn books just to 